Praise God, praise God. Bless the Lord, everybody. Good morning to you everywhere, all across the world. I just welcome you this morning to another uh, study on the doctrines of the Bible. It's good to know the Bible, and it's also good to know what the Bible teaches so that we can apply it to our daily lives. Hallelujah. The Bible is something that we should read meditatively. It is something that we should practice, for it is the Word of God sent from God to guide us on our journey from earth to heaven, on our journey from time to eternity. Hallelujah. One thing with the Word of God, ladies and gentlemen, it is timeless. No matter what dispensation you are from, Hallelujah, the word of God still remains the same. For God never change. Hallelujah, he says what he mean, and he mean what he said. He is the same yesterday, the same today, and the same forever. Glory to God. And we are just so happy to be a part of his family. We notice that mankind have marred the image of God by sin. The image of God that we were created in have been marred by sin. But thanks be to God, hallelujah, that God through his son Jesus had brought reconciliation to man. And now our soul which was carnally bound now have peace within. We must have failed him a million times in so many, many ways. Hallelujah. But God pities us just like a father pities his child. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And now we who were enemies of God, now we have peace within us because we have been reconciled to God through the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're going to be continuing this morning on the doctrine of Christ. You want to get all my teaching on the doctrines of the Bible, you'll have to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Username is Pastor Adrian Young. If you don't know how to subscribe to my YouTube channel, you just go on my page, go on my TikTok page, and then you'll see the YouTube button. You just uh, click on it, and it will take you right into my YouTube channel. You can watch all of my teachings on the doctrines of the Bible. I have several teachings posted there on the doctrine of the Bible. Go over and you can also, you know, you know, uh, follow the entire teaching series. What I normally do is like I post the highlights. So when I finish this presentation, I'll post the highlights so that you can see, uh, what you, you will know what to expect when you go on my YouTube channel. Glory to God. I am not the most professional speaker that you can find. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, um, everyone just joining in. I'm not the most professional speaker you can find, but if you notice that my studies do make sense, they do make a lot of sense. So if you're willing to learn, and if you're patient enough to learn, just go over my YouTube channel and subscribe to the doctrine of the Bible series. We begin, we continue our study on the doctrine of Christ. We study the doctrine, we give you an introduction to the doctrine on scriptures. Sorry, we give you an introduction to doctrine, then we give you a study on the doctrine of scriptures. We give you a study on the doctrine of God. We give you a study on the doctrine of angels. We give you a study on the doctrine of man. We gave you a study also on the doctrine of sin. And now we're doing a study on the doctrine of Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So we're going to look today at his sovereignty. And we're going to look at his deity. And so on and so forth. So let's look at his sovereignty. The word Lord that Jesus is called establishes his sovereignty. Hallelujah. A glance through a concordance will, uh, will reveal that the, fact that the fact that Lord is one of the commonest titles given to Jesus. This title indicates his deity 
exaltation and sovereignty. So he's the sovereign Lord. Deity. The, the title Lord, when used before a name, convey the thought of deity to both a Jew and Gentiles. The word Lord in Greek are curious or curious, which is the equivalent for Jehovah. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, so are uh, curious. And that word uh, pronounced, and that word spelled K U R I O S, curious. It is equivalent to uh, Jehovah in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Therefore, the Jews, to the Jews, the Lord Jesus was clearly an uh, it was it, it was clearly an ascription a, a, a description of deity it is clear it is an ascription of deity that means deity has been ascribed to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to the Jew because from the word Lord is used to address Jesus it, it signifies deity hallelujah glory to God when the emperor of, of the Romans referred to himself as the Lord Caesar <laughs> when he is uh, referring to himself as the Lord Caesar and require his subjects to say Caesar is Lord the Gentiles understood that the Emperor was claiming divinity the Christians also understood the term and chose rather to suffer persecution than to ascribe to man a title which belong only to God because only God is truly divine only to him whom God have exalted would they ascribe lordship and rendered worship so the Christians doesn't worship anything or anyone else apart from God hallelujah and from the fact that we say Jesus is Lord and from the fact that we invoke the name of Jesus when we pray and even when we are pronouncing benediction we invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ it signifies that he is divine he is not no ordinary and when we say divine we don't mean like the angels we mean he is eternal he is God hallelujah glory to God Let's look at uh, Christ's exaltation. In eternity, Christ possesses the title Son of God by virtue of his relation to God. And we find this in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9. In history, he earned the title. He earned the title men. Sorry, he earned the title Lord by dying and raising for the salvation of men. So, by virtue, in eternity, Christ possesses the title Son of God by virtue of his relationship to God. And we see this in Philippians chapter 2 verse 9. In history, he earned the title Lord by dying and raising for the salvation of men. So, in history, he earned the title Lord because he died and he rose again for the salvation of men and we find this in Acts chapter 2 verse 36 Acts chapter 10 verse 36 Romans chapter 14 and verse 9 he was always he was always divine by nature he became Lord by achievement to illustrate a young man born into the family of a multimillionaire is uh, is not uh, is not content with uh, inheriting what others have labored for but uh, desires to possess only what he has earned by uh, by his own achievement he is therefore sorry he therefore voluntarily relinquishes his privilege takes his place as a common 
as a common worker and by laborious effort wins uh, for himself a place of honor and wealth in like manner the Son of God. Hallelujah. Though he was by nature equal to God, voluntarily subject himself, subjected himself to a sinless human limit, uh, sinless human limitations by taking man's nature, became a servant to man, and finally died on the cross for his redemption. As a reward, he was exalted to lordship above all creatures an appropriate uh, recompense for what better claim could anyone have to rulership over men than the fact that he loved them and gave himself for them and we find this in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 the claim has been acknowledged by millions and the cross has become a stepping stone by which Jesus has ascended to sovereignty over men's heart. Hallelujah. So it is through the cross that Jesus has gained sovereignty over man's heart. Why? Because he died for us. He loved us so much that he offered himself a sacrifice for sin in order that we might be reconciled to God and hence gain eternal life. Let's look at the sovereignty of Christ. In Egypt, Jehovah revealed himself to Israel as Redeemer and Savior. At Sinai, as Lord and King. The two go together, for he who became their Savior has a right to be their ruler. That is why the Ten Commandments begin with the declaration, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage exodus 20 verse 2 in other words i the lord who redeemed you have a right to rule you hallelujah and so it was with christ and his people the early christian recognized instinctively as all true disciples do uh, that the one who redeemed them have the right the one who redeemed them from sin and destruction has a right to be Lord of their lives. Hallelujah. Bought with a price, they are not their own. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. But belong to him who died and rose uh, for them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. Therefore, the title Lord applied to Jesus by, uh, by his, by his uh, followers means the one who by his death has earned the uh, place and of sovereign in my heart and whom I feel constrained to worship and serve with all my powers. Hallelujah. Glory to God. When the important man, the important man, was reproved for carrying his bed on the Sabbath day, he replied, He that made me whole, the same said to me, Take up thy bed and walk. And we find this in John chapter 5, verse 11. He knew instinctively with the logic of the heart that he who had given him life had a right to tell him how to use that life. If Jesus is our Savior, he must be our Lord. That means he must have a right to tell us how to live our life because what? He is our Lord. Hallelujah. Let's look at his humanity, the Son of Man, his humanity. Let's look at who, who the Son of Man is. According to Hebrew usage, Son of denotes relationship and participation. For example, the children of the kingdom, uh, Matthew 8 verse 12, are those who are to share in its truth and blessings. The children of the, of the resurrection, Luke 20, verse 36, are those who partake of the resurrection of life. And a son of peace, Luke uh, 10, verse 6, is one possessing a peaceful disposition. A son of perdition, John 17, verse, 20, verse 12, is one destined to taste of doom and ruin. Therefore, the Son of Man means primarily one who shares human nature and human qualities. In this way, 
son of man becomes an emphatic de uh, designation for man in his char characteristic attributes of weaknesses and helplessness. And we find this in Numbers chapter 23, 19, Job chapter 16, verse 21, and Job 25, verse 6. In this sense, the title is applied about 80 times to Ezekiel as a reminder of his weakness and mortality. Hallelujah. And as an... Uh, As, a mis as an incentive to humanity in the fulfillment of his prophetic calling. Hallelujah. So when applied to Christ, Son of Man, designate him as sharing human nature and qualities and subject to human infirmities. Yet, at the same time, this very title implies his deity. Hallelujah. For if a person were to declare emphatically, I am a son of man, people would say, why? Everybody knows that. But on the lips of the Jew, uh, on the lips of Jesus, the expression meant a heavenly one who had uh, definitely identified himself with humanity as a representative and savior. Notice also that it is the and not a son of man. So Jesus is the son of man. That means he's deity. He's the deity who have identified himself with man and not a son of man. Because all of us are sons of man. We are descendants of man. Adam, we are descendants of Adam. So we are son of man. Hallelujah. If you tell anybody, I am a son of man, they're going to say, well, everybody know that you're a son of man. Hallelujah. But Jesus is the son of man. Hallelujah. The divine son of man. Glory to God. The title is connected with his earthly life. Mark 2 verse 10. Mark 2 verse 28. Matthew chapter 8 verse 20. Luke chapter 19 verse 10. With his uh, suffering on behalf of humanity, it is connected with his suffering on behalf of humanity. We find this in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And with his exaltation and rule over humani humanity. And we find this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Matthew chapter 26, verse 24. And let's compare Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14. Hallelujah. By referring to himself as son of man, Jesus wished to convey the following message. I, the Son of God, am man in weakness, in suffering, even unto death. Yet I am still in touch with heaven where I came and behold and hold such relations to the divine that I can forgive sins, Matthew chapter 9, verse 6, and am superior to religious regulation which have but temporary and and, and national which are but temporary but a temporary and a natural sorry and a national significance Matthew uh, 12 verse 8 this uh, manhood shall not cease when I have passed through those uh, last stages of suffering and death uh, which I must ensure for man's salvation and to finish my work for I shall I shall arise and take it with me to heaven. Hallelujah. Whence I shall return to rule over those whose nature I have assumed. Hallelujah. So Jesus take our humanity to heaven. Hallelujah. And present us, represent us there before God. So Jesus is our representative in heaven. That is the reason why we can appeal to heaven. And we do that when we pray. We have every right to do so because we have a representative there in heaven, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Hallelujah. The humanity of the Son of God was revealed not to make belief. He is portrayed as actually suffering hunger, thirst, weariness, grief, and has been subject in general to the sinless uh, infirmities of human nature. 
glory to God how how did how did all this happen how did all these uh, apply by what act or means did the son of God become the son of man how did he become the son of man how did God become the son of man hallelujah hallelujah what miracle could bring into the world the second man who is the Lord from heaven first Col uh, first Colossians chapter sorry first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 47 hallelujah the answer is that the son of God entered the world as the son of man by being conceived in the womb by being conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit and apart from human father so his entrance into the world was a miraculous one he came through the Virgin Mary without the help of a human father that was miracle itself so he became the seed of the woman and not an offspring of man hallelujah so everybody knows that a woman don't have seed woman don't carry seed it is the man who carry the seed hallelujah the women carry the egg the man carry the seed the women carry the fetus the man carry the seed hallelujah Jesus is the only seed of the woman that ever exist hallelujah and he was the only one born without a man having sex with the woman to produce to produce him he came into the world through a miracle he miraculously came into the world so he became the seed of the woman which shall crush the head of the serpent hallelujah the serpent succeed in bruising his heel already he was crucified but he was risen from the dead to crush the head of the serpent meaning that he's gonna utterly destroy the kingdom of darkness that prophecy of the serpent crawling on his belly eating dust signifies that God is gonna it, it's a constant reminder of what God is gonna do to the devil he's gonna he's gonna bring his kingdom down to the dust hallelujah glory to God and the quality of the entire life of Jesus is in keeping with the manner of his birth he who came by the virgin birth lived the virgin life hallelujah perfect sinlessness hallelujah the latter as great a miracle as the former to live a pure virgin life that is that is even a greater miracle than the former he came through a virgin hallelujah he lived the virgin life which was perfect sinlessness hallelujah and the latter perfect sinlessness is is a greater miracle than even the birth of jesus itself because no human being ever born on this planet that didn't sin until jesus came hallelujah glory to god and look at this he who was born miraculously lived miraculously rose from the dead miraculously and left the world miraculously everything about jesus christ was a miracle hallelujah he was born miraculously he lived miraculously he rose from the dead miraculously and he left this world miraculously everything about jesus was a miracle upon the fact of the virgin birth is based the doctrine of the incarnation john 1 and verse 14 the following statement of this doctrine is from the pen of martin j scott an able scholar as all christians know the incarnation means that god that is the son of god became man this does not mean that god was turned into man nor that god ceased to be god and began to be man but that uh, remain re hallelujah but that remaining god he assumed or took a new nature namely human uniting this to the divine nature in in the one being or person jesus christ hallelujah 
true God, true God and true man. So what God did in the person of Jesus is unite human with him. He unite the two nature, the human nature with the divine nature. Hallelujah. And and that that comes in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. At the marriage feast of Canaan of Cana, the water became wine at the will of Jesus Christ, the Lord of creation. John 2 verse 1 to 11. Not so did God became man. For at Cana, the water ceased to be water when it became wine. An example which may help us to understand in what sense God became man, yet but yet one that does not uh, perfectly illustrate the matter is that of a king who should of his own will become a beggar. If a mighty king should leave his throne and the luxury of the court and assume the rags of a beggar, live with beggars, share their hardship, etc., in order to improve their condition, we should say that the king became a beggar, yet was still truly a king. So, in other words, God became human doesn't mean that he ceased to be God. He just became human, but he didn't cease to be God. Are you with me, somebody? It would be correct to say that what the beggar suffered was the suffering of a king. That when the beggar atoned for something, it was the king that atoned, etc. So the king that became a beggar, hallelujah, it, the, though he became a beggar, he wouldn't, it, it doesn't stop him from being a king. He became a beggar, but he is truly a king. That's just an example used to demonstrate what Jesus did. He didn't cease to be God, though he became man. So though Jesus became man, he is still God. So he, in a sense, is the God-man. Hallelujah. Since Jesus Christ is God and man, it is evident that God in some way is man also. So God linked man with his, with his humanity, making us his true children. So we are truly children of God. And we have every right to pray to God. We have every right to appeal because that's what, that's what prayer is. Prayer is to appeal to God. When we are appealing to God, when we are praying, we are appealing to God. And we have every right to appeal to our God because we are a part of his government. We are a part of his kingdom. Hallelujah. Since Jesus Christ is God and man, it is evident that God in some way is man also. Now in what way is God man? It is clear he was not always man since man is not eternal and God is eternal. At a certain definite time, therefore, God became man by assuming human nature. What do we mean by assuming human nature? What do we mean when we say he assumed human nature? We mean that the Son of God, remaining God, took another nature, namely that of man, and so united it with his own that it constituted one person, Jesus Christ. So God linked the human nature with his own nature in the person of Jesus Christ. And that is, the, that is how Jesus became the Son of Man in the unique sense. He, hallelujah, glory to God, took on human nature, linking human, linking man with him. So Jesus is our representative. He is the God man. He is God and man. Hallelujah. Bringing man into his divinity. Glory to God, making us his true children. Hallelujah. So we are really, really children of God. 
So the next time a person asks you who you are, say, I am a child of God. Because that's who you are. By creation, you're a child of God. And by recreation, you are a child of God. Know who you are. And know whose you are. Know who you are. You're a child of God. Know whose you are. You belong to God. He have a claim on you because he manufactured you. And he have a double claim on you. Come on somebody. Because he redeemed you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The incarnation therefore means that the Son of, the Son of God, true God from all eternity, in the course of time became true man also in the one person Jesus Christ consisting of the two natures the human and the divine so in God in Jesus Christ there are two natures the human nature and the divine nature so Jesus linked the human nature with his divine nature in other words he exalts our human nature hallelujah glory to God what an awesome God instead of humiliating human nature because human nature have been marred by sin Christ exalted it by taking it on linking it with his divinity what a wonderful God he is what a deep love God have for us hallelujah there are mysteries all about us sorry We cannot understand it any more than we can understand the Trinity. There are, mis there are mysteries all about us. We do not understand how the grass and the water... <laughs> we, there are mysteries all about us. Everywhere about us we go and find mysteries. Yeah? We do not understand how the grass and water which cattle live on are converted into their into their flesh and blood a chemical analysis of milk shows no ingredient of blood in it yet the milk which a babe received from its mother mother's breast is changed into the flesh and blood of the child the mother herself does not know how the milk is produced in her in her She don't know how the milk is produced in her, which she, which she gives to the child she suttles. All the wise men in the world cannot explain the connection between thought and speech. We should not be surprised, therefore, if we cannot understand the incarnation. We believe it because he was... He has revealed it. So we believe it because he who has revealed it is God himself. We can neither deceive nor be deceived. So the very person who revealed the, the, the incarnation theory is God Almighty himself. Because we of ourselves just can't understand how the eternal link <laughs> mortals hallelujah with divine he linked the human nature he fused the human nature with the divine nature making us true sons of God hallelujah in the person of Jesus Christ hallelujah Jesus is an example of what we all will be because all of us who are believers will be fused with the divine making us true children of God and we shall shine like the stars for all eternity so why did the son of God became the son of man or what were the purposes of the of the incarnation As we have already seen, the Son of God came into the world to be a revealer of God. He claimed that, he, that his deeds 
and words were God gained, were God guided. And we find that in John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, John chapter 10, verse uh, 38. Even his evangelistic work was a revelation of the heart of the Heavenly Father. And those who criticize his work among sinners thereby show their lack of harmony with their spirit with the spirit of heaven and uh, we see this in Luke chapter 15 1 to 7 he took our human nature in order to glorify it and so fit it for a heavenly destiny that's exactly what he did he glorified our human nature he took on our human nature in order to glorify it making us fit for a heavenly destiny hallelujah glory to god he does fashion a heavenly pattern so to speak by which human nature could be made over into the divine likeness he the son of god became the son of man in order that the children of men might become sons of god just like what i have said previously and we find this in uh, john chapter 1 verse 12 and one day they shall be like him just like jesus we're going to be just like jesus hallelujah first john chapter 3 and verse 2 hallelujah even their bodies shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body philippians chapter 3 verse 21 the first man adam is of earth earthly the second man is uh, the lord from heaven hallelujah first uh, corinthians chapter 15 verse 47 therefore as we have borne the image of the earthly compare genesis chapter 5 just as we bear the image of the earthly genesis chapter 5 verse 3 we shall also bear the image of the heavenly hallelujah verse 49 because the last adam was made a quickening spirit in other words a life-giving spirit verse 45 but the endurance in the way of the uh, uh, perfection of humanity was sin hallelujah which in the beginning uh, deprived adam of the glory of original righteousness in order to deliver us from its guilt and power the son of god died as an atoning sacrifice hallelujah we're gonna stop there for this morning glory to god next when we are studying the doctrine of christ we're gonna look at the christ his of his title and the mission we're gonna look at christ we're gonna look at his title and his mission hallelujah glory to god you can subscribe to my youtube channel to get all of these teaching hallelujah username is pastor adrian young or you can just go on my snapchat um profile and you just click on the youtube button and it will take you right into my youtube channel like and subscribe and share so that others can benefit from this teaching also god bless you everyone have a good and godly day